And I'm going to hand it off to Jeff Gomez. <laughs> I'm going to try again Jeff from Credit Learning. <laughs> Close enough. This is going to be a pretty uh, participatory webinar, uh, mostly because I want us to sort of all uh, be in the moment and, and experiencing using different technologies as a way of modeling the type of thinking that I hope uh, we all leave with. And that is regarding thinking about how different technologies are being used, why they are being used, what we're trying to accomplish with those different technologies and making considerations for how we might use these um, both now and in the future, which is the title of today's webinar. Click on that link to open up the wakelet. And I will show you that uh, in a second again, but that wakelet contains these slides. It also contains all of the links for every single activity. I'm hoping as many of you as possible uh, will participate in with us today. Um, so today's session is called Building Online Strategies for Today and Tomorrow. And as Melinda said, my name is Jeff Gumis. Uh, from Crowded Learning. We are a nonprofit organization based in Chicago, and our uh, entire focus is on free and open education resources and helping make these more usable to adult ed uh, instructors and students uh, so that there's just a wider variety of options uh, for um, learning and for instruction within the field. And the reason that we decided to do this webinar is uh, for the past three months, I think this probably uh, could characterize for many of you, uh, your experience, right? Um, Mid-March is probably, that's when it happened in Chicago and in Illinois, and I'm assuming the same in California, where suddenly we had all of these school closures, where suddenly you were being asked to continue learning with your students, uh, regardless of whether or not you had in the past been uh, actively using technology with those students, suddenly um, the only way that you were going to be afforded the ability to continue learning was by way of learning how to new use tool, uh, use new tools, excuse me, helping your learners learn how to use these new tools, albeit not when you're together with them, which we all know is a challenge in terms of helping someone learn how to new, uh, use new technology remotely. Um, and then to start sort of getting back to some semblance of normal, whatever that looked like for you from a distance. Um, and so that really happened in a very, very short period of time. We were all asked to make very fast decisions in terms of things that we wanted to use. And um, for many, if you were using some technology before, that process might have been a little bit more seamless. Um, for others, it might have been a bit more challenging. But at this point, the hope is that you are in some level of sort of normalcy in terms of what you're doing and how you're doing it. And you've sort of narrowed down and settled into a few technologies that you're using pretty regularly. And that's awesome. The goal of today is for us to sit and reflect a little bit in terms of what are those tools that you are currently using and have tried using? What have been the challenges? Why have you selected those tools? Most importantly though, thinking about, okay, if this is something I'm using now because I have to, because we are separated, um, is it something that I will continue to use when we get back to normal? And I think another thing that kind of happened when we all jumped into um, having to teach from a distance was that this is something that uh, is going to be temporary. Um, and it's obviously probably lasted longer than many of us have thought. And I, you know, with the sense that we're already in June, July, August, uh, depending on whether or not you work on a sort of September to June schedule, we have no idea what things are going to be looking like in September. And so we really have to be start thinking about, okay, what are we using now? And how can we be more strategic in how we are using those? And I would argue that a lot of the tools that you're probably using, it does not matter if you're back face-to-face -face in person or we're entirely at a distance or there's some semblance of both. A majority of those tools probably have affordances that can enhance what you are doing instructionally regardless of the settings. And so we're gonna talk through that today. 
Um, so the outline for our session today is really a lot of reflection and I am going to be, as I said, actively engaging you um, during this webinar to both share uh, through the chat um, as well as through some tech tools that we're going to use and reflect upon their use so that we're sort of modeling that thinking about how can I use this in the future. Then we're going to look at characterizing tech tools and what I mean by that is, you know, you've, you've been using various tools for different things. So just trying to bucket uh, these different tools in terms of these are communication tools or these are instructional or content tools or instructional delivery tools to help sort of think about what are the different technologies that I use for each of the things that I need to be doing instructionally and um, what are the benefits that each of these tools bring to each of those things. Then we're gonna look at strategies for integrating technology. And it's not just going to be from the standpoint of what we're doing right now because we have to, but also thinking through, again, um, what September or whatever the date is for the return to normal looks like, whether that is fully at a distance, whether it is partially at a distance, whether it's entirely face-to-face, -face. Um, you have new tools in your toolbox. So what are some strategies that we can think through in terms of how to use those, um, regardless, again, of the context and the setting, and then some planning for the new normal within that. So since you are all strangers, I think one of the things that you've probably realized is when uh, selecting tools that you're going to use with your students, you need to spend a significant amount of time onboarding your learners with that new technology. And the idea hopefully has been to settle into a few specific tools that you're going to be using regularly. Um, that, you know, since, since you have your students, you've hopefully establish some sort of normalcy in terms of this is the tool that we're going to use for X, Y, or Z. Um, you are not my students, you are just my students for a day. So I want to sort of introduce the technologies that I'm going to be using as part of this webinar and how I'm intending to use them with you. So obviously um, we are in Zoom right now. Zoom is a, a tool for video conferencing and it may be the driver for a lot of you in terms of your face-to-face -face or your real-time instruction at the moment. Um, so that is a tool for communication and for real-time communication. Uh, the tool that I pointed you to in the chat, um, which is Wakelet, and I'm just gonna pop in the chat because I don't know if I'm gonna add the link again into the chat. Um, that is a Wakelet and we're gonna look at it in a second and a Wakelet is basically a tool that allows you to create collections of resources. They can be websites, they can be images, they can be videos, they can be docs that you have. And pulling them together in one place so that a student, or in this case, you might participants of this webinar, have access to all of the resources that we're going to be using today in this single wakelet. And so it's a very flexible tool that can be used in a lot of different ways. But that is my tool that I'm going to be using to organize the tools that we're going to be using as part of the participation in today's webinar. So um, I'm gonna be using a polling software uh, called Mentimeter. Now Zoom actually has polling within it. So if you've used Zoom in the past, um, you may have used the poll feature. Um, I do tend to use uh, polls in Zoom when I'm in charge, but since OTAN, um, you know, it's OTAN software, I didn't have the ability to get in there ahead of time. So I chose to use Mentimeter. Now using Zoom polling is great if you're doing it sort of for a one-time lesson, but say you have a lesson that you're going to do four times, or you know you're going to do again th the next quarter or semester or a year you might wanna use a polling software because then if you have an account, that poll is saved and it's saved so that you can reuse it the next time you teach that lesson or concept. Um, and for example, if I do this webinar again, which I really was excited to pull it together, so I most definitely am going to redo it. I have my poll already created. I have my wakelet already created that's organizing all of these things. I have this uh, Google Sheet that we're going to use as part of collecting your ideas. Um, and then I have a Padlet already created. So all of these things are already created for this webinar that I'm now giving. And so I can give it many times over because I've used these different tools and I've organized them into one wakelet. 
So that's sort of one of the considerations you want to make. But the tools we're going to use, I'm going to pull you on sort of what your experience has been up to this point. We're going to collect some information in terms of characterizing the tools that you've been using in a shared Google Sheet. Um, and we'll talk about why that's a good tool to use for different types of tasks. And then I'm going to ask you to collaborate a little in a Padlet. Um, and many of you may be familiar with Padlet. So these are the tools that we're going to be using today. If you really don't want to be hopping around and you just want to be a passive observer and to see and participate just in the chat, that's perfectly fine. But hopefully some of you are actively engaging in each of these things. The poll in particular, I hope everyone can participate in. Um, but I, I do need to have people participating so we can just see how these tools work in an environment where everyone's contributing and then discuss how that might work with your students. Um, so the first tool that we're going to look at is Wakelet. And Wakelet, as I've said, is a content curation tool um, that allows you to pull things together. An interesting thing about Wakelet, uh, it was not developed for education at all. Uh, I have a Wakelet account. I have a, uh, I have a Wakelet collection of winter recipes. And that's kind of the nature of, of what it was intended to be first, sort of like a, a Pinterest of sorts, but sort of with more ability to organize different types of resources in different ways. And then educators started using it and realizing, hey, this has a lot of benefits for education. So if you have not, um, that link, the very last thing in the chat is the link to the Wakelet for this session. So hopefully you can go ahead and click on it. Now I'm in Google Slides right now, which I guess I should have also mentioned. Google Slides is a teaching tool, right? This is a tool that allows me to organize my instruction and deliver it. And again, if you've been designing lessons and doing them with students online, um, if you create Google Slides for those lessons, that creates a nice sort of frame for you to, again, reuse the next time you want to teach a particular lesson. Um, so just consider that. So Wakelet is a tool that I'm going to open up here. And hopefully, uh, if you guys are in the slides, then you're already in the Wakelet. But what you're going to see is I've created the slide deck and I've linked it in here. I've added um, these resources, these teacher tools, which we're going to look at. And then the three activities that we're going to do, if you remember, I showed that uh, all the tools that we're going to be using, activity one is going to be a Mentimeter poll. All you're going to have to do is click on this to launch that poll. The second activity is going to be um, a Google Sheet that is shared. And you can open these all up right now. Um, and then just, you know, once we're ready to hop into them, go, go for it. But um, activity two is going to be this uh, Google Sheet. And then activity three is going to be this Padlet. Um, and again, I'm using a bunch of different resources with you because I, I'm trying to model some of the things that, that we can be thinking about as we reflect. Um, again, you might be using just one or two resources that you've really gotten your students familiar with. I wouldn't recommend just one day saying, we're going to use five new resources today together. Um, but the way Wakelet works is, in this case, I've created just this sort of resource, uh, this bucket of resources for you. Um, I could also use Wakelet to create lessons, right? So here is a one that I created um, as part of a webinar that I did on um, a tool called Skillblocks, which allows you to find free and open education resources. And what this allowed me to do was I can pull in an interactive activity on fraction equality. I can pull in another one using a fraction number line. I can pull in lessons from Math is Fun or from Khan Academy. I can pull in games um, that deal with equivalent fractions. And I can pull in practice from Khan Academy. And I can pull all of those things together in one wakelet. And then the way that I share that with students is I just click on share. And you'll see it's easy to integrate with Google Classroom. Or I can share the link as I did with you. I can send it through Remind. I could send it through Facebook. I could tweet it if I wanted to. Um, there's a bunch of different, I can even PDF it so that there's just a hard copy PDF file um, that I'm sharing with students. So it's a very flexible tool, but I'm using it in this case to provide you with all of the resources that are needed for today. So that as opposed to when we get to activity one, I have to share a new link with you. And then when we get to activity two, I need to share a new link with you. If I get you all into this wakelet up front, then when I say, let's go to activity one, um, it's already 
in the wakelet. And so that's, that's why we're using this as um, the tool. Um, so with that, I am going to start with our first activity. And so if you are not in the wakelet, uh, please do so. That's the, the link that's there. Um, if you are, have decided that you just aren't planning on opening the wakelet, um, this is a poll that we're going to do using Mentimeter. And there's three questions. I will launch into it in a moment. Um, but if you have a phone and you want to take the poll on your phone, maybe you just want to see what that works, looks like, go ahead and use your QR code reader right now to scan this. Um, or in the Wakelet, you could click on the link for the poll, which is activity one. Or uh, if you're not in the Wakelet, but you just want to open another browser tab, you can go to menti.com and you can enter the code 171721. So I'm going to escape out of here in a second. Again, if you want to scan this, go ahead. And I'm going to hop into Mentimeter. And there's three questions. Awesome. I see lots of people responding already. Um, the three questions, and the first one you can answer as many times as you want. What are the primary ed tech to tools that you've been using? The next question relates to um, whether or not you would use these tools previously. And the final question is whether or not you intend to continue using these tools moving forward. Um, but I love looking at the Wordle, um, the word cloud that uh, sort of starts forming as people are sharing the different tools. So not surprising, Zoom um, and Google Classroom and Google Docs uh, are the big ones. We see Padlet, we see Remind, 48 have responded. So that's kind of a nice uh, feature here that I can see um, how many people on here have responded. Uh, so Zoom seems to be the big winner. If you're familiar with word clouds, uh, the larger the word, the more, uh, the more people entered that as their response. So the, the ones that are the biggest, um, there's not a lot of surprises in here. Google Docs, Google Forms, Google Meet, Google Classroom, lots of Google, uh, Zoom and Padlet, Quizlet, um, and see Flipgrid and Screencastify. So, um, YouTube is also in there, uh, which is probably more widely used than maybe you didn't even think to, to add that. Um, but that obviously is a tech tool. So um, we're seeing the clear winners. And um, there's, again, not a lot of surprises there. When we go to the next slide um, and statement of for the tools you mentioned, which statement best fits your usage uh, pre COVID. So uh, nine of the 26 that have responded to this said I had used all of these tools beforehand. Um, the largest number is I had used some of these tools, but uh, some were new. And then these are going to sort of tweak a little bit as folks are responding. And five of you are uh, have said that I had used none of those tools. And um, a hats off to you, because I think this has been a really challenging time for folks who are not um, used to using technology. And it has really forced a lot of people out of their comfort zone. Um, so great. So it looks like there's a good mix. And again, I would assume that some of these tools you probably use, some of these tools you have them for many of you. Let's go to the next one. Um, good answer. There's no right or wrong. You're not going to get judged if you answer the last one. Um, but which statement best fits your planned use of these tools when we quote unquote return to normal? And again, I think for a lot of us, we probably anticipated this might be a two or three month thing. Uh, might not have necessarily thought that it was going to go through the summer. And when we think about the new normal, even if you have face-to-face -face classes uh, scheduled and you think that you'll be able to do that, um, when we think about the fact that one, we might have students that aren't comfortable going back to class. So how are we going to accommodate those students that want to access these services, but they're not comfortable going into a classroom setting just yet? The other added layer that I feel is going to be a challenge for us is we're going to have increased demand for adult education. I know there was the jobs report from the Bureau of Labor Statistics that came out and unemployment might be creeping down a bit, but we know there is a, a massive amount of unemployment right now. And as we know, the story goes with adult education, 
when unemployment is low, adult education enrollment is low because people are working. And then the flip side happens that when unemployment is high, people uh, seek out education because they feel about other opportunities. And this again is a tool called Mentimeter. So uh, in reflecting what we just did, um, so what was the task that I was trying to accomplish with the poll? So um, I see people are, are answering my last question, but so my next question is, what was the task that I was, I was hoping to accomplish by using Mentimeter? Um, but polling software, yeah, it does give me the opportunity to get sort of controlled information from you if I can sort of organize that in a way that you all have the ability to respond, right? Right now, you're all adding into the chat and there's a flurry of activity and that's great. That's participatory. But if I know there's a certain number of things and information that I'm trying to get at, a polling software works great. Um, so in what ways was this an effective tool for doing that? Um, obviously, again, if I wanna do polling, I'm gonna figure out what tool I wanna use. I'm gonna make sure that I work with my students to understand how to use it. And then I will consistently use that tool so that there's not sort of the, the sort of um, learning curve that has to happen every time I'm using it. But you could use this upfront as a tool for just getting a sense of where your learners are. It, uh, you could use it mid-lesson as a tool to see if learners have understood what it is that you're teaching. You could be using sort of real-time formative assessments to ask questions. And if everyone's answering correctly, then you know you can move on. If everyone's not answering correctly, then you probably need to um, stop. You could do it, I mean, you could use it as an empathy check. Um, I've, uh, one of the sessions that I've been to in the past three months, someone is using Google Forms as a tool for um, getting empathy. The question is Mentimeter, is it a free tool? Um, it is a free tool. You only have, you have limitations in terms of how many live polls that you can have active. Um, uh, but you can, I think right now, actually, I think with a lot of tools, they're all free for everybody. Um, I think with Mentimeter, you have the ability to have three free tools. Uh, there's other tools like Kahoot that allow you to poll students as well. Quizzes is another tool that allows you to poll students. And again, it gives you this opportunity um, to, to get answers from your students in an anonymous way, but also to graphically look at it and, and talk about responses. Um, what factors would you need to consider if you were to use this with learners? You'd need to consider, do they have access to the technology that is needed. Now, if you noticed at the front end, I gave you three different options for accessing it, right? So if you were in the Wakelet, you could just click on it and launch it through the Wakelet. If you uh, wanted to stay in this presentation and in Zoom, but you wanted to access it from your mobile phone, you could use your QR code reader. And if you were using this in class and you have a projector, you can, um, you can zoom in to that QR code, uh, uh, QR code, excuse me, so students could scan it with their phone. Um, so there's all sorts of parameters in terms of how you might want to use it, or you can enter it in um, using menti.com in the code. So there's different ways, and, and you'd want to work with your students to understand how they're going to be accessing it. And then finally, my last question is, um, how might you use this tool for similar tasks? Are there alternative tools? to Mentimeter. And I think we've kind of walked through some of those. I guess I spoiled it by, by talking ahead of the question that I had. Um, but yes, you could use this for formative assessment. You could use it for teacher meetings. One of the things about Mentimeter is you can actually create presentations in Mentimeter. So you can just have slides that you're creating that don't have polls and then add slides that are solely a poll slide. Um, Google Slides, if you're using Google Slides, has integration with a tool called Poll Everywhere, which is another tool, it does cost money, but you can seamlessly embed your polls into Google Slides so that you as the presenter don't have to hop back and forth. Um, but these are some of the things that I need to think about in choosing dates for meetings, that's a great idea. So giving options uh, for people to select in real time and then you know, using that data to make a decision in real time as opposed to the endless emails that we tend to use um, when we're trying to set dates for meetings. 
So when we're thinking about these tools, we need to think about what's the reality in terms of how I would use these with learners. Um, it has a specific purpose, but what are the other sort of things that I could use it for? Remember the example I gave with Wakelet, it was not intended to be an education tool. Now that's their primary uh, area of business with Wakelet, which is also a free tool. Um, and so thinking about what are the affordances this technology offers me and how could I use it for some of the different tasks that I want to be doing. So I'm going to walk through two examples of uh, scenarios in which technology has been used to solve a problem that was presented to uh, teachers. These are real scenarios uh, in adult education. So um, I want you to sort of think about, you know, what's going on in this situation and, and what is the problem being solved. So the first scenario that I'm going to bring up is um, providing open access live classes. So in response to school closures, a school in Texas set up a schedule on a Google site where learners can see what classes are available and they can join via Zoom. So in this case, because they can't meet face to face, this school set up a Google site and they set up their schedule. They actually, at the time, had two months worth of Zoom meetings. Uh, so where it was the times that the session would be offered, who the instructor was. Now I've blurred those out just to, for not anonymity purposes. Um, the content and the level for the class and then the ability for anyone to join the Zoom meeting. It didn't, you didn't have to be enrolled in the class. It was sort of a, a recognition of the fact that you may or may not be able to come to class right now. So they, they decided we're not going to stick with sort of the, the regular schedule because we know everyone's been so disrupted. But what we're going to do is provide all of these classes, make them available to anybody who wants to join if you can. Here are the links, they're already there. You have one website that you go to to be able to join these classes. And we're going to provide the recordings of each of these afterwards. Here's COVID scenario number two. Um, so, and this is a teacher that I actually work with here in Illinois. So at a community college here in Illinois, an adult ESL teacher began open office hours using Zoom. And students sign up for those Zoom office hours via a, a schedule uh, that she has shared with her learners on a shared Google Sheet. So she's created a Google Sheet and it has the times that are available and students can go and access that Google Sheet and if there's a time slot available, they can enter their name and they've then reserved that spot and she uses her Zoom room for students to be able to participate or to join those office hours. This teacher, and this is the part that I find very interesting, this teacher had always had open office hours in person. So when we were in class and working in person, she's not a distance learning educator. Um, her classes were in person. She had open office hours. She reports at the time, she said students rarely took advantage of those office hours. And she reports now that more students take advantage of office hours now offered virtually than they ever had when they were offered in person. So thinking of these two scenarios and these two obstacles uh, that both of these scenarios, the, the schools or the teacher had to overcome, I want you to use the chat again to respond to what problems were these teachers attempting to solve by using the tools that they selected. Continuing communication, connection, attendance, digital divide, giving some students privacy around their problems. Yep, that's great with the with the um, open office hours choice, student motivation, um, access to class and very organized meetings um, for the classes. Uh, there was a lack of face to face options. So they had to overcome that uh, scheduling challenges. So they just created a fixed students with flexibility. If you can join, you can join. If you can't, you can't, but we'll have the recording available and accessibility. Awesome. Uh, what existing obstacles or barriers before COVID? So what are some barriers that you probably experienced in your situation? So pre-COVID, think of some of the barriers of learners engaging with adult education. What barriers might continued use of these tools help learners overcome in the future? So even when we get back to class, think pre-COVID, what are those barriers that we know often exist for students that using the tools that were used for this current situation might actually help students overcome? So class schedule, not working for all students. 
student comfort levels, scheduling and kid problems. Um, the teacher with open office hours shows that student participator is higher virtually. Students who weren't engaged uh, before might be able to. Um, choosing between work and school. So uh, shy to participate in person. So these are all great things. When we think about some of the barriers to accessing education right now that we, we know have always existed, transportation, childcare, you think about that teacher at the community college, um, what student, adult ed student, has time to kick around uh, after the, the class time that they've sort of worked out to be able to attend to then add on additional hours that they aren't tending to their familiar responsibilities or their work responsibilities or other responsibilities to be able to fit that teacher's schedule and be on campus. Whereas with their home and they have the availability to access open office hours virtually, they're more likely to attend. Now also there's probably additional supports that a lot of people were seeking out during this time. But when we think about what these technologies offer, um, it allows us to scale some of the things that were limited in our ability to do and, and were before COVID. Um, when I mentioned earlier that we're going to have probably an influx of students who are seeking access to uh, education, um, and we might not be able to be able to accommodate all of those. Is there any reason why you can't post classes or a Zoom schedule for anyone to be able to attend if they want to? Um, they have the ability to, to access those um, classes and you can record those classes and make them available to students afterwards. Um, so when we're considering the technologies that you've used and the, the technologies that you might want to use and be interested, what you need to be thinking of what is it that I want to accomplish, which tools afford me the ability to accomplish this, and what are the logistics that I must consider. And you've stated a lot of those in your responses um, already. So things like student access, language barriers, the digital skills that they need. But when you're thinking about what technologies to use, um, it's really what are my goals and what am I trying to accomplish and what are the best suited tools for doing that? Um, so now we're gonna hop into our second activity. And this is going to be using a shared document um, in Google Sheets. So. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to have you launch from the Wakelet activity two, which is a shared Google Sheet. Um, and what you're going to do in that Google Sheet is click on a row and you're going to enter information about a tool or tools that you currently use. So if you click on that, it's going to launch a, a Google Sheet that everyone has the ability to go into and edit. Awesome, you guys are already in there, so cool. So I created an example, my name is Jeff. Uh, the thing I want to accomplish today is to train educators um, and you have a webinar. So I'm using Zoom and what logistics uh, must I consider? Internet connection, I have to consider uh, that the computer is preferred but it's also accessible for by a smartphone. Um, you must know how to join, which you, a lot of you already knew how to do. Um, and right now I'm using Google Sheets and you all are hopping in. You see all these colors, that's where everyone is clicked in. Um, so in using this tool, one of the considerations I have to make is helping students know not to overwrite someone else's response. So pick a row, um, you can scroll down. Some of you clearly have, uh, are responding in that third column or the last column, excuse me, based on questions that you have gotten from students. Great place to start in terms of thinking of the logistics, right? Um, you can be as well planned as you want and then suddenly you start using it and there's things that you did not think of um, that come up. And so, you know, you'll be better off next time um, having that experience. But ideally, um, you know, we want to consider as many of these barriers or logistics uh, ahead of time so that we're making correct selections. Uh, or the best selection for our students. So um, great. So a lot of you are focused on um, there's a conferencing apps. We see some folks using Google tools and again needing access. So access is a huge logistical consideration. It is probably the biggest, right? Um, Google Classroom. Um, what's app? So Google Classroom, I want to integrate work-based learning. Olga, I love that. So 
one of the things that's great about Google Classroom is it allows us to organize uh, and provide a home base for students. But one of the great things about it, it also integrates tools such as slides and docs and other in the Google suite ecosystem that are work-based tools. These are productivity tools that a lot of employers expect you to be able to use. Um, so it, it gives you that additional affordance by using Google Lab. Um, have my students practice their speaking? Um, and you're using WhatsApp for that. So uh, that's awesome. And WhatsApp is a very popular tool. Um, engaging students in conversation. So um, in order to do that, right now, we have a webinar where there's 68 of you, right? Um, and we're all going to be together for this whole time. But if you have a class and you wanted to provide differentiation, or if you wanted to put students um, in different groups working on different things, Zoom allows you to create breakout rooms. And that allows students to work in small groups and you can sort of move through those. Um, so it's a great tool that sort of simulates what you might want to do in a classroom in a virtual setting. We did the Mentimeter poll in real time. And some of you mentioned that in the chat, like one of the benefits of doing it in real time was that we could see people's responses. There's no reason that you couldn't send that Mentimeter link out to students before class so that when you are coming to class, you have their responses, you've already gathered those responses and you can kick off class looking at those responses. So when we think especially about right now where you have limited face-to-face -face time with students, the more things that you can front load ahead of a lesson, particularly around sort of checks like that or getting information that you would might ask at the start of class, the better. So if they're used to using a tool like Mentimeter or some other polling software, you can send those questions out ahead of time and say, give them a due date, say, we're gonna kick off class on Wednesday um, based on your responses. So that's called the flipped model of instruction where you're providing them something to do ahead of time and then they're gonna use that information at the start of class um, the next time you meet. So um, yeah, you don't have to put a due date, but I think there's limitations on the a window that students can respond. But thank you for that question because it prompted me to think about something um, that I had forgotten to share earlier. So um, in thinking about Google Sheets, we just did an activity with Google Sheets where I was asking you all to contribute into a collective document. Uh, so I want you to answer the same questions. Uh, this is the last time we answered these questions. So in the chat, uh, what was the task that I was asking you to complete? Now, I want you to think about why I used Google Sheet for this task. Um, if I had used the polling software, right, uh, that polling software, I had fixed answers that I wanted you to respond to. I wanted your specific answers to those questions. Um, and so I was able to create a poll that had those sort of fixed responses. The first question in the Mentimeter was a word cloud, but because I knew you'd have one word answers, you'd be saying Kahoot or Google Classroom or um, uh, Zoom, right? So that was a good poll because we'd get that word cloud and those words getting bigger because of the fact that you, um, you were going to have sort of these one word responses. I used Google Sheets for this activity because all of your answers were going to be wildly different, right? And so I, there was no way for me to give you sort of fixed answers to select. I wanted you to have the opportunity to be able to answer in an open response environment. And I wanted to be able to work off of that to hold the discussion around the different tools that folks are using. So it gives you flexibility in using it. And again, we could use it ahead of time. So I think you've probably already answered, but in what ways was this effective uh, tool for the task that I was doing? So we just talked about that. It gives us flexibility in our answers. It also allowed you to see what other people were saying. Now, I, I asked you to provide your name. One of the things that you said was a benefit of Zoom was the, an or excuse me, of Mentimeter was the anonymity. I asked you to provide your name. I wouldn't have to if I didn't want to. Um, but I was doing that so that you could sort of claim a row um, and, and do that. But so this gave us the ability to see each other's answers um, and to see others uh, sort of challenges or the logistics that they've overcome. And it allowed you to um, be more open response 
So what factors would need to be considered in using this tool with your learners? Deleting, yes, that is a big one. So Google Sheets, because it's a shared document, um, everyone has the ability to accidentally delete somebody. And someone gave the great suggestion of assigning a row in advance, so that's a tip. If this were a tool that you were to regularly use, you could pre-populate it with students' names because um, you probably already have that in a list of cells in a Google Sheet somewhere. Um, or you could assign students numbers and give them that. So students would need to be able to type. Um, it is hard to use a Google Sheet on a phone. So that's a logistical thing. It's a great tool. There's other tools, which we're going to use in a second, that give us some of the same affordances of sort of shared response and everyone seeing it, but that are more mobile friendly. Um, I do, I have used Google Docs, Google Sh uh, Slides, Google Sheets on a phone, um, and it's fun, but it's certainly not optimal, um, but you are able to do it depending on your tech level of ability. But if more of your students are using a mobile phone, then maybe Google Sheets isn't the right response, particularly if it's gonna be something that you want some immediate response. But again, this is something that you could do ahead of time um, and share with them so that they have time. A great suggestion from Amy is use Google Forms. So in a very similar manner, if you had those same questions in a Google Form, I could send that out to students ahead of time or during class or after, it's a lot easier for them to enter into a Google form. And then if you've used Google forms before, the resulting data is actually available to you in a Google sheet. So you're, you're actually using Google forms, which is much more mobile friendly for students to answer those very same questions. And then it will be in a Google sheet and we can see everyone's responses. So that's an absolutely perfect suggestion, uh, Amy, excuse me, and that's one of those considerations, right? So if they're going to be accessing on a phone, maybe Google Sheets isn't the best tool. If you have a computer lab or if you know they all have Chromebooks, then it is a good tool. And to one person's point within the Google Sheet, they're learning how to use um, productivity tools such as Google Sheets, which is obviously a set of skills that is very helpful in the workplace. Um, and so there's many different ways to do the same task. It's thinking about uh, what are the things that are going to help um, be most effective for my learners based on our current situation. So you kind of already answered this question, so we're going to uh, move on, but Google Forms is another tool that you can use. We're going to do a Padlet and we're gonna see the affordances that Padlet gives us in a second. Um, so that sort of transitions us into characterizing these ed tech tools. Um, you have a number of different options um, for doing different things with technology. And so making that selection can sometimes be challenging. This is a fun little couple questions that I like to do um, when I present on integrating technology. Um, and so this first question, just use the chat pod to answer. Uh, so most of you are saying B. It seems like a pretty straightforward response. Um, I've B, C, D, it depends, yes. Um, you could technically probably get it in there with the wrench. You could technically get it in there with those pliers. But the best tool for this, um, as we know it, would be B. Um, the best response I've ever gotten to this was, because we were talking about mobile tools, uh, was using your smartphone to nail the tool, uh, to hammer the nail in, um, which probably wouldn't do very well for your smartphone. But these tools are sort of single purpose, right? Each one of these tools has a very singular purpose. So it's very clear which tool you grab for many of these tasks. Um, we're gonna go to this next slide. And the scenario here is, this is a gentleman calling for the bus. And if you live in Chicago, if the bus is leaving and you're running, it does not stop. So he has missed this bus. And now he is going to be late for work. So which of the tools would you use in order to handle this situation and letting your employer know you'd be late? So which tool you chose probably depends on your boss, right? There's a consideration that you have to make around the context. 
for you and your boss, right? Now, if this is a teacher, uh, say you're late for class, your boss is probably not sitting at their computer looking at email. So that is probably not the best way to operate. Um, they probably also are not going to necessarily stop class and answer the phone mid class. Whereas a text, which tends to be the thing that we like to use the most, is a sort of immediate thing that we know they're going to see. Um, and that it might be more likely, again, depending on the person, um, which tool they're going to use. And this has to characterize our thinking about what tools we use. When we're thinking about communication, many of you have probably started using or maybe already were using WhatsApp and Remind because you know that texting is something that your students are more apt to do. And those apps sort of um, involve a text-based format as opposed to email, which we know a lot of students are reversed to. And sometimes they just don't see the need to have an email account. And so there's a lot of dependencies here. And I, I used to do a session on writing for work and talking about how we were using technology more in, in, the, in the realm of writing. Um, and this was like six or seven years ago. And I remember talking about texting and it was, it was really focused on the amount of email we get. And this is why it's important to be teaching these skills. And at that time, I remember having the conversation where people were aghast at the notion of using texting and texting for communicating with your boss. Um, however, uh, now I think it is the preferred mode of communication for a lot of people. And so we need to think about that with our learners. So I'm going to hop out of the, um, way, uh, the, excuse me, the presentation again. And in your uh, wakelet, one of the resources that I've provided is a, a teacher tool page. And this is on the Crowded Learning website. Now, this was something that uh, we had not had up on our website, but realized might be very useful for educators as everyone was jumping into using new technologies and new tools. And so on our teacher tools page, which is in our Explorer section, so you see the Crowded Learning website, um, we've organized a bunch of different tools around their various uses. So what am I trying to do? Why am I trying to do it? And how would I use this with my students? So around um, video calls and meeting, around chat and messaging tools, subject area course platforms, so the content that you're going to be using with students, supplemental learning content. So just to differentiate for you the difference here, um, these subject area course platforms are platforms that you actually students can create logins to, that they are very course based, that they have um, accounts that they can sort of know where they are and keep returning to. And you might have students set up accounts in there. And a lot of them also afford you the ability to monitor and create classes that you can move students into. Um, whereas supplemental learning content websites these are great content sites, but these are sort of things that students aren't creating accounts, but many of you may be familiar with something like math antics. These are very engaging math videos. And so these are tools that might allow you to augment your lessons with, you know, engaging videos and you might share these in Google Classroom or in Remind. Um, but there's math resources, there's ESL resources. These last four are ESL um, and a variety of different resources. Then there's quiz and assessment tools. And then we also have management assignment and sharing tools. So these are tools that allow you to um, sort of organize your content and create a home base, such as Google Classroom, which a lot of you had mentioned that you are using, um, and other learning management tools, and then tools for sharing content and providing uh, either content for your students in a single place or even doing some of the collaboration that we're doing. So Wakelet is one tool that we've used um, some people may have set up Google Sites. Uh, I actually, the Crowded Learning website is on a Google site. I find it to be very easy to use and update. Um, so it's very user friendly. Um, so this is just a range of different tools for you to consider um, using. And one thing that I'll point out at the top of it um, is a link to a uh, a implementation plan template. So if you click on this, you don't have to do it now, you can just watch, but it's there and I will send it out as a follow-up. Um, this is a tool for you to start framing what are the, what are the things that I want to use with my learners 
and uh, doing that around three buckets. So what are the tools that I want to use for communication? Why am I, what am I trying to do? What are the logistics? Which tools am I already using with learners? What are they most familiar with? And then here's sort of an area for you to describe um, what you want. This you only have you only mode. If you want a copy of this, you go to file. Doesn't matter if you have a Google account or not. Um, if you don't have a Google account, you can go to file and download and it gives you the opportunity to download it in all of these different formats. If you do have a Google account, you can just click make a copy and it will add a copy of this resource to your drive. And what, again, it is, it's helping you frame your thinking around tools for communication and thinking through the purpose, the logistics, and the tools that are available to you, instructional content. So what is the content that we're actually going to be um, delivering to students? And then how do I manage and track that? Um, so this is a resource that's available to you on the, on the Crowded Learning website. Uh, again, the reason for that is the options are kind of endless. And just a note on the tools that are on that tech tool page, the things that we put in there was specifically ones that we know are being used, as with everything on our website, these are things that we know are being used um, by adult educators. So, um, you know, they've, they've been used within an adult ed setting. Um, and so part of this formulating our plan for today and tomorrow is uh, thinking of those three buckets, right? Um, so how am I communicating with students, which many of you learned right out of the gate was a challenge uh, because you may not have established digital channels for communication with your learners up front. Uh, what are the content resources and what tools can I use to create uh, activities to share and to manage all that for my students? So when you're thinking about communication and the tools that you want to use, and we've been doing a lot of logistical thinking, so I think you're, you're, you're all doing an awesome job. So I think you've already been thinking about many of the things that I'm talking about here. Really, what are your goals? Uh, in communication in particular, a lot of people gravitated towards what tools are students already using. And again, I mentioned that WhatsApp and Remind have been popular because it mirrors texting, which our students are uh, most apt to use. And then you might be using multiple tools, right? And so in thinking about this, it's what needs to be sort of in real time and what can be asynchronous, meaning I'm just going to get this information out to students in some way and they can tend to it um, when they tend to it. So Zoom obviously is sort of synchronous. This is something that we're going to be doing in real time. Although, because you can record and you can save those videos and share those videos, that allows you to have a real-time class, but then also gives that asynchronous option if students aren't able to attend um, at the time that you're delivering that class. Um, so when we're looking at these various tools, uh, we do use these video tools more commonly when we want to be in real time. Email is obviously, there's limited expectation for people to respond in right away. And we know that messaging can be in, in between depending on the user, like that scenario that we showed earlier, um, someone might be very quick to respond, sometimes they might not be. Um, but these are the tools and obviously again, that, that device that you hold in your hand, it is also actually a phone to make phone calls, um, which I sometimes forget. Uh, most of you, since we saw in the middle of the word cloud, Zoom was the biggest uh, word, then we, I know that most of you are probably using video conferencing tools. Some of you may have issues with Zoom. So as we've learned over the course of the past three months, uh, Zoom wasn't necessarily designed for education settings. So they had to deal with a lot of privacy issues. I don't know that they fully accommodated those privacy issues, but there's a number of different tools that you can use for video conferencing. Um, some of them are shown here. And the video that's linked here is a 20 minute video where uh, an adult educator in Rhode Island gives an overview of all four of these tools, five of these tools, excuse me, um, in the video, both from a facilitator perspective and from a student perspective. So it's a great overview of these different tools in case you haven't chosen a tool or maybe you are thinking you might wanna use another tool, this is a great video um, for that. I've already said this about messaging tools. Um, what we've found is, uh, you know, most learners were already using uh, WhatsApp uh, socially, or a lot of them, particularly ESL learners. So that might be the tool that you decide to use for this type of communication. 
Um, a lot of people do like Remind uh, for education because Remind allows you to create classes and it allows you to sort of organize things in, in that manner in a, in a sort of managed way that an educator might want to be organizing communication with their learners and providing opportunities for um, communication. So uh, as we're thinking about this synchronous, asynchronous um, thing, when we're looking at content, we also need to consider what is the content that I wanna use in real time? Um, and that's going to involve me uh, more uh, heavily involved in having to assign things and what's going to be low instructor involvement. And then on the flip side of that, what's the level of agency that learners have to um, use this content? So when we think about uh, right out of the gate, and this wasn't just an adult ed problem, this was a K-12. If you talk to your nieces or your nephews or your kids, um, my niece and my cousin's kids, they are middle school, high school, they hated for the last two months because it was like three hours of face to face and then just a deluge of work that was thrust upon them because the notion is I have to give something for my learners to do. Um, and they were throwing them in Khan Academy and just like here, like just work through Khan Academy. Um, that doesn't mean Khan Academy is a bad tool, but we have to characterize how are we going to use that with learners? Is it actually my instruction or is it something that learners can get additional practice and additional remediation on the concepts that I'm teaching? And what level of activity do I want to have in terms of assigning these things? So when we're looking at the tools on that teacher tool page, these tools are all ones that are low instructor involvement, meaning that students have the ability to explore these tools on their own. You don't have to be assigning things and you don't have to worry about students not knowing where to go. Um, they can sort of freely explore and find topics of interest. And the ones that are listed here are digital literacy, our ESL um, with USA Learns and Learning Chocolate, our reading with Reading Skills for Today's Adults. Um, math is Fun is a, is a site that just has tons of math content um, with lots of different a variety of activities. So these might tools be tools that you still wanna make available to your learners and maybe you're putting them in a singular place where they know to get at them, but you're not necessarily actively using them. So if you've started using them already, um, continue using them, but just understand that those, aren't, those are for students sort of self-learning. And that's good because you don't have to have a ton of involvement um, and students can freely explore that content. When we look at tools like Read Theory, which is a personalized reading program, and Ed Ready, which is a personalized math um, program, again, there doesn't have to be a ton of instructor involvement other than setting the student up. Once they're set up, these two tools take care of it from there because learners take a diagnostic at the start, and then they're given the opportunity to work through content based on where they are in terms of their level. Now that means it's limited learner agency in terms of they don't have a lot of selection or the ability to choose what they're doing because it's dishing up content based on their current level, but it gives them the opportunity to continue learning in a manner um, that fits uh, their levels. Uh, read theory is all levels. Ed ready is more, I would say adult secondary in terms of the level. Um, these tools over here uh, all are, uh, uh, definitely great tools and they uh, learners can explore on their own but if learners are really going to know what to do it does involve some level of the learner teacher excuse me assigning that content or providing guidance Khan Academy is one of the most widely used resources in adult education in terms of any polling I've done of teachers in terms of what resources do you use with students Khan Academy is always the winner but we also always hear or often hear teachers say but it's hard for my students to know what lessons in Khan Academy they should be working on. And so that does require some level of teacher or higher level of teacher involvement. Um, and then ReadWorks is another reading platform, uh, but students cannot explore content on their own. It can only be accessed when the student is assigned content. So there's limited learner agency and there's also high instructor involvement. One of the other things you need to consider with content and with communication tools is bandwidth. Um, so this is a metric, I did not create this, this is something that I picked up, but uh, it also has that sort of the, the 
the frequency with which you want to be working with learners, but it's characterizing also the bandwidth. So Zoom is definitely a data, it's a data sucking machine. So if they have a limited plan in terms of usage, uh, they're going to be limited in their ability to uh, hop onto, a, onto Zooms, right? So these are considerations that need to be made. Whereas um, if you wanted to do things uh, both asynchronously or you know, low bandwidth, things like that Google Sheets or even a Padlet, those afford students the ability to access those on their own low immediacy, but they're also, they don't really utilize a lot of uh, the bandwidth that um, a, a student might be required to sort of fit within based on their data plan. Uh, then the other thing that you have to think of in terms of resources is what tools are you organizing things with? So because I saw Google Classroom was the second largest uh, word in the word cloud, it appears that most of you have been using Google Classroom. Um, and that's great because it does provide a home base for everything. Some of the other affordances that we talked about within Google Classroom is that it integrates uh, docs and sheets and slides. And so students have the ability to develop skills in these tools that are obviously very relevant to the workplace and for future success. And so that's why um, a lot of people gravitate towards it. Uh, but you also have to think about tracking student progress. So when we look at some of the tools that I just mentioned, like Khan Academy, Common Lit, those are tools that you can create accounts and you can track student progress. Things like Math Antics or Math is Fun you don't have the ability to track student progress. That doesn't mean you shouldn't use them, but if, if getting that sort of time that students are working and getting those proxy hours is really critical to you, then you need to sort of balance that into the decision-making in terms of what you're using. Um, I've already talked about the, the benefits of Google Classroom, but in terms of a management tool, again, it does provide that home base. It integrates with all of the products that I've talked about already. And, um, there's a lot of tools that automatically integrate into Google Classroom. So I showed you in Wakelet, when I went to share it, there's that Google Classroom icon. So I can click on that and it's going to allow me to assign it into Google Classroom. Padlet has the ability to do that. Khan Academy has the ability to do that. CK12 has the ability to do that. So there's a lot of tools that automatically integrate um, and allow you to, if you have something that you want to assign, just click on this icon and it's going to assign that to students. And so that's another benefit of Google Classroom. Uh, but within, again, uh, this management um, sort of consideration, beyond just sort of managing students and communicating and assigning things, you might want learning management platforms so that you can have quiz and have that reporting. Um, you might want to, instead of caring necessarily about reports with grades, uh, create proficiency-based lessons. So we're tracking a lot of states that are moving towards teacher verification model, which is not necessarily proficiency-based, but where they know that if a student has completed this particular lesson and completed it successfully, they have completed X number of hours because a teacher has verified that this lesson takes that amount of time. So if you've created those lessons for students or activities and your state approves that, then it doesn't mean that lesson goes away when we get back to class, right? If you have a project or an activity that is more virtual that students can do on their own, and you know how long it's going to take to do that, then that's a proficiency-based lesson that might be an option for additional learning, or it might be the tool that you use for students to demonstrate. Um, and you can continue using that even when we get back to face-to-face. -to -face. A lot of folks like using quizzing tools, um, again, that's one that you're going to want to settle into one that you like. So Google Forms is nice because you can create quizzes and you can see the data specific to that quiz. There's some more robust tools like quizzes, which allow you to get reporting that's question specific, that you can see how students answer to each response, that allow gamification within the quizzes that you do that allow you to search other quizzes that other teachers have created on the same topic. So sometimes when I use quizzes, I'm not even using something that I created from scratch. I just typed in a topic and found a perfectly great quiz that someone else has created and I just pulled it into my account. And then another thing that I want to mention because I'm really intrigued by the notion of student self-reporting because when we talk about providing learners with learner agency, 
um, this gives you the opportunity to do so. So um, this is a Google form that I created that allows a teacher, a teacher to assign a, a, anything and the student can fill this out and enter in the information for that, whatever resource they did, and they can rate the resource and they can say how long it took them to, use, to complete the resource. So it's one way of sort of providing more options for learners and giving learners a, a tool to manage their own learning, to report on their own learning, which gets them into sort of things like self-management. And it's also supporting them in the concept of lifelong learning. Uh, this is a form uh, that is used by a teacher in New Hampshire. And they, before COVID, were using this to give learners complete sort of free will to be able to use learning apps of their choice. So they indicate the app that they're using. Um, they indicate the lessons that they're going to be completing. They write in how many minutes they're going to practice. So they set a goal and then they track in 15 minute increments how often or how much time they're spending in the app and providing feedback on whether they liked it, something they learned, or did they have trouble. So this is really giving learner agency and having learners set goals on a weekly basis for what they want to learn on their own. So again, even when we get back to class, this might be something that you set up for, you know, bonus time for students or giving them incentives to uh, participate in their own self-guided learning outside of class on a regular basis in a structured format where they can be not only using the tools of their choice, learning the content of their choice, but reporting back to you on, on what they used and how they used it. So we're going to get into our final activity. And this is um, what tools will you continue to use with your learners? So this is going to be on a Padlet. So again, I want you to scan this QR code if you're choosing to use your phone. Now Padlet is much more mobile friendly than Google Sheets is for entering in content. Uh, so either scan the QR code that you see here, uh, or I'm gonna hop into the Wakelet. Um, and in the Wakelet activity three, and some of you may have already gone in here because you had access to it ahead of time. Um, this is how to launch the Padlet. Um, I'm seeing a question around uh, some of the resources if they're free. All of the resources that I am uh, sharing with you today are free. So given the time, I might not uh, spend too, too much time on here, but if you can hop into the Padlet, um, I want you to, for any one of these tools, uh, so can you think of those two buckets that we talked about, communication tools, content tools, and management and sharing tools. I want you to think about which of these, uh, pick a tool that you plan to continue using with your learners. Uh, and I want you to indicate how are you using the tool and why did you choose to use it? We've, we see people have entered in Zoom. So I use Zoom for teacher meetings. I'm already somewhat familiar. I like this week's, I, I list this week's lessons here. I provide the link to Zoom. I provide student resources. So uh, this teacher, uh, is using Google Sites as a home base for putting the lessons and providing the link to her, to her uh, Zoom lessons or her, his, um, and also student resources that they can access. So that's great. Um, I'm gonna ask the question, uh, how much time does that take you each week? So one of the benefits about using Padlet is you can create permissions that allows students to comment on other people's responses. Um, so when we're thinking about the tools that we wanna use and the opportunities that we wanna provide students in terms of engagement, um, if you want to create sort of collaborative types of activities that students can be doing, Padlet might be better because it allows you to not only have students sharing their content within um, the Padlet and providing their tiles, these are called tiles, but it allows students to respond as well. And so it's, it's serving the same purpose in a sense as Google uh, uh, Sheets does in terms of everyone being able to enter in their information. It's a little bit more graphic. Uh, it's a little bit more unwieldy. So students would need to be used to this. However, some of the things, the bonus things that it offers me 
is the ability to add in that commenting. And so when we think about, you know, what that can afford us as educators, um, again, thinking about a flipped classroom, this is something that you could send out. Uh, you could have a reading assignment that you give students and students respond and you ask students to, you know, respond to other students' responses. Uh, you could pose a math problem and have students explain their answer in here. And you could do that ahead of time. So again, you're coming to class with students having already engaged with something related to that day's lesson. Um, and you have the ability also for students to be, you know, commenting um, on one another's responses. And that gets into digital literacy skills, right? Like communication and appropriate communication. And when using social media, what's an appropriate thing to say? What is the effect if you, you know, you, you need to be kind, you need to be supportive in, in your comments on other people's um, posts. So I like Padlet because of the fact that it, it allows for this sort of collaborative nature and it allows for students to work together in the same place. And again, I also do like it for um, the purpose of being able to send out something ahead of time. I'll show you an example of it in a second. Padlet and, and Sheets both give you some of the same affordances, right? Everyone can add a row in Sheets, everyone can add a tile um, in Padlet, but there's, there's distinctions between the two. Padlet is more mobile friendly. Um, Padlet is far easier to operate on a mobile device than Google Sheets is. Google Sheets, you have to have a Google account, you have to have the Sheets app downloaded if you want to be able to use it on a mobile device. Um, the benefits of Google Sheets is it integrates into Google Classroom, but Padlet is another one of those tools, and I didn't see a lot of, I, I did see some people mention Padlet, uh, but it is another one of those tools that you can share in Google Classroom. Um, so if you are using Google Classroom, and you're creating assignments in Google Classroom, Padlet is something that you can seamlessly um, integrate into your Google Classroom. So the last things I wanted to walk through for those of you who uh, choose to and can continue to stay um, is just thinking about what are your strategies for actually integrating these resources. So I have all of these different tools. I know how I can use them for communication, for content, and for um, sort of my home base. So how do I want to actually do those in the future when we say get back to some semblance of normal? And I'm gonna not sort of spend too much time on all of the different types of different blended learning, but blended learning is a model for instruction that allows you to provide both synchronous and asynchronous learning within your instructional practice and sequencing. And there's some elements that might be online or, or entirely online and some elements that might be face-to-face, -face, there's always at least some online element to a blended learning sequence. Um, I like the station rotation model because again, I like to bucket things. And so when we think about the type of learning that can happen for a particular topic that you want to be teaching, um, teachers obviously have a very important role. And I hope that one of the things that we've learned from this is Throwing a student on Khan Academy is not the solution. It is a part of the solution. It has certain things that can benefit students, but that is not, to me, the way students learn. There is an element of an instructor and a need for an instructor to facilitate instruction in learning and conversation and questions. And so if we have all of these different tools that can provide additional practice, that can provide additional remediation, that can provide personal learning. Um, how do we pull these things together and use them meaningfully so that the time that I have with students is incredibly effective and that I'm doing what I do best, which is teach, ask probing questions, help students make connections around concepts. Um, and so the station rotation model has you consider how can learning happen in small group with a teacher how can learning be collaborative where the interaction is between students around the content? How can learning happen individually where the student is working on their own on something? So on practice or additional remediation? And are there opportunities for personalized learning for that student? So the focus is really on the learning and what is being learned and the fact that there's different ways to do it, not specifically on the instruction, 
There's various ways that that learner is going to be engaging with content. Um, and it's obviously a very flexible model. The notion isn't that you're going to leave here and I'm going to do every single one of these things for every single lesson. But the notion, the, the concept here is think about your technologies that you're using now and where do they fall into these different buckets. And so how could I be doing two or more of those, these things around every lesson based on the tools that I've started using or might have already been using before I came, uh, we, we started the COVID uh, journey that we've all been on. Uh, learning modalities vary, but they're all connected in blended learning, right? So there's different ways that the learner is engaging with content and learning that content in ways that might fit them better or better suited for that learner than others. And then learner engagement varies. So this very much looks like sort of an in-person classroom, but you certainly can have students collaborating and working in small group work with technologies. One of the instructors today uh, in the chat mentioned that in Zoom, they're using breakout rooms. So that allows for this small group work, right? So you're providing those options for learners. So um, not to sort of go into every single tool that is on that teacher tool page, but in looking at these sort of elements of a blended learning sequence, Zoom is obviously something that facilitates, it's a, it's a tool for delivery that facilitates teacher-led instruction. FET is a great tool that has math and science simulations that uh, allow the students to interact with and explore and sort of make guesses and check their guesses on different math concepts and different science topics. So a FET is something in a simulation that you might send ahead of time for students to play with, but then instead of walking through a PDF of a math concept during your very limited Zoom time, you might lead a facilitated discussion around having students sort of pose questions and test uh, using that simulation and then working through the simulation with them and asking questions like, why did that work? Why didn't that work? Or predicting, do you think this will work and why do you think this will work? And then using the simulation to have everyone um, see in real time uh, whether or not a certain student's solution would work or not work. So it's one that really facilitates rich discussion that should be reserved um, for that face-to-face -face time that you have with students, whether it's virtual or in person. So collaborative tools, WhatsApp, Padlet, uh, Google Sheets are all tools that could allow you to collaborate. Those are the technologies and facilitating this action of collaboration. And the content that you might use is say common lit. So you could have students read a story and then have them engage in a discussion in WhatsApp um, on discussion questions that you ask them to talk about with another student based on the story that they've read. Um, so maybe in a face-to-face -face environment, you're getting rid of the technology piece here in terms of WhatsApp, but that story and those questions that students are answering, they could still do in a small group in person. There's plenty of math examples of tools that you could propose questions for students to answer in small group, face-to-face um, -face or virtually. Um, for individual work, I think I've, I've you know, you've seen Wakelet in action because you're using it for this. And I showed you a lesson that I created that has different resources that all support that lesson topic. So Wakelet is a great tool for creating lessons that you can just make available to students, right? So these are things that you could work on for this topic you share the link with students, and then they can access that at any time at their, at their you know, whatever time uh, works for them, um, depending on whether or not they need it. And tools such as Khan Academy also provide that sort of individualized work on topics that you might um, use. Uh, the two tools that I showed in that matrix that are really good for personalized learning. So this is where the, you're letting the computer take the wheel, right? And it is helping that learner work through content based on what it is seeing that learner can or cannot do. So EdReady is a great tool for math and that, and Read Theory is a great tool for reading and providing that personalized learning. Um, here's a Padlet that I created just to give you an example of something that you could do with students as a flipped model. Uh, this is on order of operations. And so what I did was create three prompts for students to respond to ahead of time. And these are open-ended prompts. 
So students are going to have different answers. And this is a progression. I'll go to the last one. Um, this is a super cool tool called um, from the Math Learning Center. It's these open manipulatives. And you can create things like this and then share them with students. So the goal was for students to create rep, uh, uh, expression that tells the number of tiles. And I, I had three different prompts with three different representations. This last one is, is going to yield the most variety. So just to sort of get at the progression, what uh, we have yellow tiles and green tiles. So a, one student might say this is eight plus nine plus nine plus eight plus eight. Another student must, might say this is eight times three. So they see one, two, three plus three times three plus three times three. And they would put those responses in the Padlet. And what that allows students to do is provide as many different answers as they can think of. And we're going to see a whole range of different answers in here in the different um, response pods. And then if I send this ahead of class, when we get to class, students can spend time, we can say, OK, um, you know, Kelly, why did you say this? What did you see that made you uh, come up with this expression? Or I could say, Kelly came up with four times three plus four, and this is a different prompt. Um, I could ask a challenge another student and say, hey, can anyone explain Kelly's thinking to me? And so now I'm using this tool as a flipped model. Students are engaging in a problem that everyone can solve to whatever way that they would solve it. And we can spend class time having students explain one another's thinking. Um, and so this provides a tool for more in-depth conceptual learning and discussion. Um, and it is a tool that is flexible. So I can use Padlets for all sorts of different things. And we've seen a variety of different ways in which you can use that today. So I am going to stop there. I'm not going to get into the shameless plug, um, but I encourage you to look through resources um, that we at Crowded Learning offer. Uh, we have a tool called Skillblocks that allows you to uh, search for skills in math and then see various resources uh, that align. I'll show it to you here, I guess. Um, that align to that skill. So you can create a skill block uh, around a topic and you can uh, in include the Khan Academy lessons that align. You can include CK-12 lessons that align. You can include FET activities that align and then share that with students. So it's sort of more of a playlist type format um, that students might just work on on their own. Uh, we also just released an app last week um, using a tool called Glide. We did this in partnership with the Florida Literacy Coalition. And uh, this is a GED prep app that is entirely based on using Khan Academy videos. And as I said earlier, one of the challenges that teachers have with Khan Academy is not knowing where students can go uh, or should be going to learn things. So Florida Literacy Coalition had created a website that organized a bunch of different Khan Academy videos into these topics. We worked with them to build it into an app. And so we have these different topics and then these uh, skills within. And then when they go to that, there's a bunch of different Khan Academy videos that they can um, go to and they can launch. It allows them to watch the video in app it allows them to mark as complete so they can track that they've done something or not. This is entirely designed for learner self-study, so there's no reporting that goes to the teacher. Um, they can comment on the video so that they remember uh, you know, anything that they want to jot down. They can indicate the date. But they can also launch the video in Khan Academy. So if you are using Khan Academy as a tool that you're creating accounts for students and they are tracking, they can just use this as the mechanism for you know, finding the specific videos that they need to go and work on based on the GED topics that they need to study. And then when they get to that video, um, rather than watching it in app, they can launch it in Khan Academy and it will, it will launch them into their account in Khan Academy. And then you'll get all the tracking and reporting that happens in Khan Academy. Um, and so this was something we released at literally just last week um, because of the fact that 
we know that a lot of folks are looking for tools like that. I'll also mention on our homepage is a link to that GED app that I mentioned. Um, so this is a link to where you can get the app uh, as well as information about skill blocks. And I think that kind of wraps it up. So Janice asked a question. Um, I need options that allow me to create offline materials. Any ideas? Uh, so Janice, if you're still on, it looks like you are, so cool. Um, yes, there are tools for you. So one of the things I would love to mention, and I probably should have mentioned it earlier, is I use QR codes in here a lot. Um, and there's a reason for that because QR codes give you the ability to scan something and get to the mobile version of it or to get to additional resources. So I'm going to share with you a project that we did with um, ASU. Um, you, can, you can create uh, hard copy documents that have QR codes that allow students to scan, say, the video that's a supplement to it, um, which is something that I would encourage. Like, say you have a worksheet that has questions. Um, you can do that in Google Docs, and then it could be online and students can access it online if they have access. You can print that out so that students can answer those questions um, just on a hard copy. And you could also have a QR code that um, links to any ancillary resources that go with it. And the tools that are available offline, um, if I'm scrolling down here. So <clears throat> within these, Read Theory and Common Lit, these are both reading uh, programs. All of the stories in these allow you to print out the stories. Um, so you can print out the stories and the comprehension questions and make those available to students. Uh, within Reading Skills for Today as Adults, uh, you do have uh, downloadable PDFs and that allows you to download the PDF that has the story and it has the questions. And you can also download the supplement that has all of the activities. So again, there's a vocabulary activity, there's a comprehension activity, there's language activities, there's writing activities. Those are all in this Word doc. And again, you could share that Word doc if students have tech access and have them working in the uh, Word doc, or you could just print it out and make that available to students. Um, on the Crowded Learning website, I'm going to uh, take you to a place on the site where we have alignments of everything that's in this tool skill blocks that I was just talking about. And within math, uh, there is a set of, uh, it's called Common Core Sheets. And these are all downloadable worksheets in math. And if you click on what I just clicked on, so you'll see this will lead you to Common Core Sheets. We've done alignments of Common Core Sheets to the College and Career Readiness Standards. And so on that, uh, on that alignment document that we created, you can click on any of these. Um, there's like literally over 5,000 worksheets at all levels. So this is the College and Career Readiness level. So we've organized it by level, domain, and standard. And um, if I click on any of these, it will launch me into Common Core Sheets. And just so you can see, for every single one of these, um, I can preview the worksheet. So that's what the worksheet looks like. I can actually make changes to the worksheet. Uh, it's popping up now. I can download this worksheet. Um, and it has the questions and the answer key. And it's kind of nice how they did this. So you can like print them both out. And you can have them side by side so you can see the answers in line. Um, you can adjust these at will, but for each of the skills that they have, in this case, it's combining add-ons. There's 10 worksheet options. You can create new sheets. You can download them all. You can share it with a QR code. But these are all downloadable hard copy uh, worksheets in math that, again, are aligned by standards, and we've provided those alignments for you. So there's plenty of these resources that do have downloadable and printable versions, both for reading uh, and for math that you can make uh, available to students who don't have online access. Sorry about the long, long answer to your question, but I wanted to show you um, the things and where they are on the site.